Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure. Um, if we could just come and sit down and get ready um, for the next, I don't know how long you're going to speak, Rob, but uh, whatever it, how, whatever amount of time it is, you're going to want to, uh, you're going to want to listen. Um, it's my my honor to introduce Rob Shetterly. Uh, Rob is a friend. He lives up in Brooklyn, Maine, in 2002, when the war in Iraq was. I'm sorry, when the war in Afghanistan was raging, and we're listening to the propaganda machine tell us that Iraq um, needed to be invaded and bombed. Um, that was a very difficult time for many of us that were paying attention and understood the lies that were happening and the deception that was happening at the time. So Rob Shetterly um, has the gift of making art. Um, and he used his art making as a way to deal with his own fury and angst. Um, and so um, that art project is called Americans Who Tell the Truth. And I can say this, um, I am still at this point in time in our history, feeling a great deal of rage and angst about what's happening in our world. So um, one antidote for each of us um, I would recommend is to go to Rob's website, Americans Who Tell the Truth, and um, just peruse the 245, uh, the stories of the 245 people that he has, uh, portraits that he has painted, and hear the stories. Um, we were talking about it earlier. And the truth is, um, Rob is offering to us through his art, is telling the stories of an incredible community of Americans. Um, and this is the America that I want to live in, the America of the Americans who tell the truth. Um, so Rob, come and tell us more. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Mary Beth. You, you, you do live in that America. You make it. Um, what a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. What I want to talk about is um, kind of fitting in terms of the stories that have already been told having to do with um, uh, World War II, the end of World War II. And it, at least it begins with a friend of mine named Roger Kirby from, from Brooksville. I live in Brooksville, not Brooklyn, uh, which is all in the same peninsula. And um, Roger's an Englishman. He's about my age, a little younger. He uh, has been a painter for many, many years. His father was a, a, a pilot, or not a pilot, a navigator of a Lancaster bomber, English bomber during World War II. A Lancaster was similar in its ability to drop bombs as a B-17, about the same size. And when he died about, um, uh, 15 years ago, the father, whose name was Rip Kirby, his mother, I mean, his, his wife, Roger's mother, was going through his stuff and found his navigator's log and gave it to Roger. And this was the log of the 30 missions that he had bombed in France, uh, hitting German um, sites uh, in, in, in France, flying from the uh, northeast coast of England. And Roger got this idea that what he would do was uh, go and visit all 30 of those sites and paint what he saw there now. And in some cases they were high-rise buildings, in some cases they were the remains and remnants of pillboxes, in some cases they were uh, just farmers fields and cows and horses. There were all kinds of things. There was a skateboard park. There was, and the point was, as you looked at all these 30 paintings, um, it was a rumination on, on time, on war, what persists, what goes away, what burdens we still carry, what we've erased. But I wanted to show you, and some of you, you'll sort of be able to see this. I wanted to show you one of the paintings now and one later. You see that? It looks like, what does it look like? Cathedral. It looks like a cathedral. That's not a cathedral. That's a V2 missile silo that looks like a cathedral. 
This was uh, pretty much intact at uh, Saint-Omer on the coast of France. I was just talking to Roger about it the other day, and we were talking about how, in a sense, what we cathedralize in our cultures. Sometimes it's the spirit and the resurrection and, and the celebration of life, and sometimes we make a cathedral for our willingness and ability to, to kill, to create death. And sometimes they look almost the same. And in this case, as I was looking at this, I was thinking about all those missiles launching, you know, that were sent into London from a silo like that. It was like, to me, they were sending off their own steeple again and again and again to create as much terror and havoc as you possibly could in the, in the world. But um, it was something else Roger said to me uh, that I prompted what I really want to talk about today. And that is that um, I asked him what he's doing now, and he said, well, he's been really impressed over the years with the standing stones that are in uh, Britain and in Brittany and all over that area that have been there for nearly 5,000 years. And um, he's been trying to respond to them with his own painting, not just paint the scenes of the, of the stones, but try to understand what they're really all about and, and um, respond to them in some creative way. And then he said to me something, and this is what uh, I want to actually read now a little bit about what I wrote in response to what he said. <clears throat> So Roger said about the standing stones, he said, the original creative act was to stand up a stone. I thought, wow, what an interesting thing to say. How actually might that be true? The stone at rest has been sleeping for centuries, dreaming since the last ice age. Its placidity may call attention to its beauty and its integration into nature, but stand it up and its role changes. It's invigorated, it's individuated, individuated, inspirited, it has potency, it ritualizes its space, sanctifies, perhaps like an altar without a church. It commands the shape and the space, calls the residents of the area in relation to it, in relation to it. It focuses attention, it teaches, it casts a shadow, and the shadow becomes the keeper of time, the arbiter of time. Its standing role is not to dominate, but to remind one to be present, to be conscious, reminds one of one's own consciousness. Perhaps it is creative because it is the result of a newly conscious mind. I mean, imagine the first person to think of taking a stone and standing it up, and that the consciousness that is implied by doing that. Or the act of standing the stone up in a way created the consciousness of the mind, the way a truly creative act does. The landscape with a standing stone becomes a conscious landscape conscious of its own history. The standing stone is the ambassador of the mute world to the conscious mind, the messenger, the emissary. It offers a spiritual partnership, a conversation between the land and the mind. It is not destructive, it is not exploitative. Rather, it is a call to harmony. It anchors, provides an address, it signifies home. The standing stone sounds the awakened land's first clear note of human creativity in relation to nature's. Most of the Neolithic stones are in circles like seasons or cycles, like congregations in conversation, like restorative justice circles, praying or chanting. They amplify the land's heartbeat by sounding the human. They amplify Oops. The standing stone is the sentry for what is above and what is below. 
The standing stone may be the first creative act. It may also be the first committed act. It commits to taking the materials of nature and crafting human identity, community, and dignity, not separate, but in relation to. An act of moral courage is like a stone stood up. An act of moral courage rearranges a social space and it redefines community. A person standing up resists the mythology and propaganda of violence, of separation, of racism, of dehumanization, of exploitation, of power, and of the justified injustice of the status quo. The way a shadowless pasture of conformity and corporate docility becomes redefined by the standing stone of the iconoclast, the truth teller. The paddock of slavery redefined by Harriet Tubman. The field of status quo history reorganized by the standing stone of Howard Zinn's people, his, people's history. The long arc of male dominance unbent and rebent by the militancy of Alice Paul. The massive bloom of invisible secrets made visible by the standing stone of Daniel Ellsberg. The original creative act of the common good is the standing up person, the signal that justice has a heartbeat, the truth that compassion requires courage. The standing stone of moral courage evolves the consciousness of the community. It tells us that power hates ceding control, scorns equality. We'll do practically anything to subvert real democracy. The standing stone envisions and makes possible the dignity of other stones. The crazed murderers at My Lai discover their shame in front of the standing stone of Hugh Thompson. A poor Palestinian home remains standing because Rachel Carson's standing, once enacted, cannot be knocked down with a bulldozer no matter how many times it runs over her. In jail, Camila Mejia says, now he is finally free because he has followed his conscience and refused to continue participation in an illegal and immoral war. His stone stands in prison. He says he was a coward, not for refusing to fight, but a coward for having accepted taking part in the war in the first place. A coward for fighting. Right here in Brunswick, Bruce Gagnon stands up in the backyard of BIW and General Dynamics demanding conversion from militarism to sanity and sustainability. Consciousness changes, a community grows, a standing stone is a creative act. William Sloan Coffin said, Socrates had it wrong. It is not the unexamined, but finally the uncommitted life that is not worth living. The standing stone of moral courage seeds its place, creates its place, its address in history because it creates value, creates worth, makes a claim to nobility that would otherwise be preposterous. Think how power has tried to deface the standing of Chelsea Manning. The more mud they sling, the more law wielded like shears to cut her statue down, the taller and more adamant she stands, revealing <clears throat> not only crimes against humanity, but the oppressive crimes committed to make her invisible. There is a kind of meaning, a claim to stature in our lives that can only be purchased with courage. Think of Samantha Smith, a 10-year-old frightened of nuclear holocaust who launches a letter like a kite, and she clings to the tail of that kite until she is teaching adults how to recognize the absurd manipulations of the Cold War, a standing stone. I want to tell you a little story right now. Some of you may know this, but some may not. I need a visual aid. 
There it is. Here's a good one. I suspect that not too many of you know who this woman is. Chanifa Kamvongsa. How many of you know who Fred Bramfman is? Was. Good. Well, I'm going to tell you the story of the two of them because they're important for all of us. Um, you know, during the Vietnam War, from about 1964 to 1973, the U.S. did not only bomb in Vietnam and Cambodia, but it also bombed in Laos. As a matter of fact, it dropped more bombs on Laos, a country we were not at war with, officially, than we dropped on Japan and Germany during World War II. We didn't know anything about this. This was referred to as the secret war. And it was purposely kept a secret because it was illegal. Uh, Fred Bramfman was in Vientiane in 1969 as an education consultant, actually working for the US government. And all these refugees were coming into camps outside the capital city. And he began to meet these people. And he, he had been there for some time. He spoke Laotian. And he started to meet these people and ask them what, where they were coming from and why they were fleeing. And they explained about the terrible bombing that had been going on to the northeast of there in the Plain of Jars uh, for years, and that they could no longer stay there. These were all poor rice farmers. And uh, he asked them to, if he could write down their stories. And then he found um, a, a Laotian person he worked with who got to work with them. And he asked them not only to write their stories, but to draw pictures of what they remember of what happened. Eventually, there was a book put together which, by him, but of, of the stories of the farmers uh, called Voices from the Plain of Jars. If you don't know the book, I, I very highly recommend it. He, became the, he came back to the United States and testified in front of Congress to try to get people in this country to understand what was going on. That we were you know, just carpet bombing civilians uh, for nine years. Um, and part of it had to do with the fact that the North Vietnamese, when they were trying to uh, get south into South Vietnam, had started going outside of Vietnam thinking it would be a safer route. And so they would go into Laos and down through Laos and then back into South Vietnam. And the United States was bombing that Ho Chi Minh Trail. But they were also bombing in these civilian areas because they thought that these poor people might be sheltering the path at Lao, which, which was the, uh, the uh, resurgent group inside of, of uh, Laos, which was fighting against their reactionary government. Uh, you know, this went on and on and on. I got reacquainted with this story a few years ago when a man, an Englishman in Laos, who's been working with uh, the survivors. I mean, I'm going to. I'm going to sort of get ahead of myself here, but just, it, it's, it's impossible to tell a story, and it's almost impossible to get an idea of the scale of this bombing. There were all kinds of bombs were dropped on Laos, but perhaps the most insidious uh, were over 250 million cluster bombs. At least 80 million of these cluster bombs did not explode. They're still exploding every day. People are still 50, 60 plus years, especially children, are picking them up, stepping on them. They're being you know, plowed up by a farmer. They explode. Um, Fred Brampton was trying to tell people what was going on. He died a few years ago. Um, this man in England, this Englishman there, uh, Mike Boddington, had gone there more than 20 years ago to bring prosthetics to people there who had lost arms and legs. Uh, to try to care for them. And Mike t told me all about Fred Bramfman, and then he told me about this woman, Chanifa. Uh, Chanifa is a, an American, a Laotian American. Her family fled uh, from Laos in the late 1970s. Her parents, uh, she was very little, uh, her parents didn't even want to tell her the stories of what had gone on there, but she gra gradually found out, and then developed this organization in this country called Legacies of War, which has dedicated itself to 
telling the history, providing money for care of the people who are still being wounded, and of course trying to get this unexploded ordinance out of the environment. And uh, you know, one of the last countries in the world to contribute in any major way to this was, of course, the United States. All she was asking from the United States was they contribute once a year to the amount they spent every three days bombing the country for nine years, every three days, which would amount to about uh, you know twenty million dollars a year. So this is her this is her portrait. I'm going to read the quote that's on it, and it's just sort of a repetition of some of the things I've already said. But uh, I just want you to hear it again. The U.S. dropped 260 million cluster bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War. An estimated 80 million did not detonate, scattering throughout Lao villages, rice fields, schoolyards, pasture lands, forests. The equivalent of a plane load of bombs was dropped every eight minutes, 24 hours a day, for nine years. More per capita than any other country in the world. This is called the secret war. The mission of Legacies of War is to advocate for clearance of unexploded bombs and provide space for healing the physical and emotional wounds of war. I would suggest, you know, go to their website. Uh, for a long time, the organization Legacies of War was this one person. Now it's two or three people. Um, but they're doing an enormously good service for the people in Laos and also for people in this country who need to know this history, uh, who would also, I think, reach out and try to contribute to do the best they can to clean it up. If we were cleaning it up at the same rate as we have been for the last few years, it would take 3,000 years to get the bombs out of the environment. That's why it's so important that more money be dedicated and that this country bear more responsibility for the cleaning of it up. Um, so I just wanted to read one more thing here. So standing, standing stones are like cairns. They mark the way of justice and morality in an otherwise desolate and trackless landscape. They are the dots that we need to connect. They are the map of the narrative we must tell. I wanted to show two more pictures. Uh, going back to the story I was telling about Roger in the first place in his own paintings. This is, a, this is a photograph of his father, the navigator, who he followed around uh, France to find the places where he bombed. And this is the very last painting that Roger did in this series, and it's of a cockpit of a Lancaster bomber. And the only light in this con con in the cockpit comes from the uh, glowing of the radium, the radium dials and also from the stars that are out in front. And what, what he's looking at, if you look through that shape of the, the lens of the front of the cockpit, what we're looking at is the Big Dipper and the North Star. What we don't see there are any pilots. Nobody's driving this thing. And I think what Roger was asking us to do was to take charge, to lurch forward, to you know, land this plane, to do something else. But this is not the way that we can make a decent history. Thank you very much. I just want to say one more word about, uh, I mentioned Bruce earlier, he's sitting right over here, you all know Bruce. Um, I want to say something more about the conversion campaign, which has been going on now, well, for years, and, been, and uh, has been heated up the last few months with two, two actions there, total of uh, 20, 47 arrests. Um, this is, you know, one of the things I was trying to say and, and um, is it how much, how important it is at certain times to repeat and repeat and repeat, to be, to be persistent? Because what happens is consciousness actually changes then. You know, I mean, and, and then when it changes, it changes much faster than we would expect. I mean, just look at the last 
20 years, the way thinking about gender in this country has totally changed. You know, with the Occupy movement, the conversation around wealth disparity changed. Now it's everywhere. I mean, it, it, people get it. They understand it now. They can say it. With the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, white people are talking about white supremacy now. Uh, we didn't talk about that before. We talk about it now. We understand, at least are beginning to understand what it really means. Fully, not, you know, probably not anywhere near yet the full impact of it, the full economic impact of it, what it really means in all of our lives, what privilege really means, but that we're having that conversation. You know, uh, the you know, conversation around climate, all it took was you know, another year of big storms and all of a sudden we're having that conversation. All these actions that have been going on at BIW about general dynamics and the possibility or the necessity of moving from militarism you know, to producing uh, an economy, an infrastructure of peace in relationship to nature, it's changing the conversation. At first, nobody would even talk about it. You know, they totally ignored it. Now they're listening. Now there are some articles. People understand that this is something that has to be done. And, you know, the sooner the better. And I think it's so important that we, you know, that what Bruce is doing, if you, if you haven't read that, um, the, uh, the brochure that they've got there to hand out on, on, it's full of factual information about conversion, what it means, what it could mean. Uh, please take one, read it, get involved in this issue one way or another. It's, it's crucial. I mean, we're not going to deal successfully with the climate issue unless we deal with the militarism issue. These things are linked, and we've got to look at it that way and understand what it means that we can't talk about one successfully without talking about the other. Very good point, and I've been there twice. Um, you know, that's, that's a really important one. And you can see, there, I mean, whenever these conversations change, you, you, you see where the resistance comes from. Then you know what you have to do. The, the question was, are, is there going to be a bigger show of all these paintings, or maybe all of them shown again? Last uh, November, December, they were shown at Syracuse University, the entire collection. I'd never seen them all. Nobody had ever seen them all. It was pretty extraordinary and humbling for, for me, certainly. A um, couple things. One is um, there's going to be a big show in, in um, uh, February through March, in uh, February, March, maybe into April, in Charlottesville. There's some people there at the university, in the in the uh, community, and um, in the local high schools who want to use these as a statement against the neo Nazis and white supremacy. They're bringing a very large collection there, and they're also bringing a whole lot of the people I've painted to talk at the same time, which is pretty exciting. Um, and um, just, um, there's a, uh, going to be a, um, I'm combining with uh, USM, I don't know where this is going to go yet in terms of actual shows, but there's a program that they've got um, now, and there's going to be a conference in October around the theme of moral courage. And this is, the portraits are going to be a part of that. And just how that's going to, sh what shape that's going to be and, and where it's going to go after that, I don't know yet, but, um, if you look at the Americans to Tell Truth website, you can always see where the next shows are. I mean, there are five or six shows going on right now, most of them relatively small. But um, they keep moving. <laughs> the question was, what's the connection between peace work and political work? And I guess it's um, um, it, that's a, a tough one, because when, when we're running in a, in a society, in a culture that doesn't really want to talk about peace, you know, to run candidates or to insist on having candidates or to vote for candidates that that's their main platform uh, seems like uh, is always, um, um, y you wonder what you're doing with your vote. 